Hey class, I wanted to make a help video for this homework problem about the bowling ball. This is a fun and tricky question, so I kind of wanted to talk through it with you all a little bit. If you notice, we're given the scenario where you have this bowling ball that's first thrown down the alley, and it's thrown in such a way that it's moving forward with an initial velocity that we're told of 7.8 meters per second, but it's thrown in such a way that it's not rotating at all when it first enters into the lane. So its initial omega value would be zero radians per second, and let's assume this is at some point that we're gonna call zero initial position and zero initial angular displacement as it first enters into the lane. Now, we're told it's going to be sliding initially, which means that it's rolling or it's moving with slipping, and because there's this frictional force, this kinetic force of friction acting on it, even though omega initial is zero at the moment it starts, because that force is at some lever arm distance away, there is a torque acting on it, and it will immediately begin to experience some non-zero angular acceleration, which will cause it to begin to rotate. And so because it will have some non-zero angular acceleration, the thing you're asked to find in part B, it will be increasing in angular speed over time. Um, since it's going clockwise, it's becoming more and more negative, to the point at which eventually it's going to be rolling so fast that its omega is large enough that it stops sliding, stops experiencing kinetic friction, and begins rolling with out slipping. So eventually, once it gets to this point here, it will be rotating fast enough. Its omega value will have increased to some value so high that it will begin rolling without slipping. So at this point in time, it will, and only then, will we know that the translational velocity or the velocity of the center of mass of the object will be equal to omega times r, but that's only the case here at the end. At the beginning, v initial does not equal omega initial times r because it's slipping, not rolling without slipping. So that's the first thing to make sure that we understand in terms of what's going on here, is that we have this scenario where for some unknown time, t, which again is some value we don't know that part C asks us for, the ball slides experiencing a kinetic force of friction. That time you have that force of kinetic friction, which is going to be equal to mu k times the normal force. During this time, it will be beginning to rotate while sliding. So rolling with slipping is what I would call that. Okay, so just that we've established that. Now let's jump in and, and look at what we're asked. We're asked in part A to find the linear acceleration during this time. Because it's sliding, because of static friction, it's going to be some value that's not zero. Then, because of this torque generated by the same static friction, you will also have some angular acceleration, which we're being asked to find. Once again, for part B here, some people want to say, hey, doesn't A of the center of mass, A tangential, equal alpha times R? No, only when you're rolling without slipping. So in this case, we cannot use that because we're not yet rolling without slipping. So anyway, just so you're aware, we need to figure out those two things, and then we need to somehow try to figure out the time it takes for it to get to the point of no longer slipping as it goes. So with many of these types of problems, the first thing we need to do is think about which big idea we want to use to try to solve when we get started with part A. Do we want to use energy analysis? Do we want to use kinematics? Do we want to use Newton's second law and forces or torques? Or do we want to use momentum? Those are our four big, big picture ideas. And for me, if I know things about this force and I want an acceleration, immediately my mind goes to Newton's second law. So if I again kind of try to get a free body diagram going for my ball, we already have one up there, but let's just kind of create an even better one down here. We're going to have the weight of our object, mg, going down. We got the normal force technically acting at the bottom at the point of contact. Normal force going up, and we have this force of kinetic friction going backwards. So we know some of the forces in the x direction will equal mAx. Some of the forces in the y direction will equal mAy. And some of the torque about the center of mass will equal I 
times alpha. So right away by looking at our free body diagram here, the only force in the x direction is we have negative mu k times fn, the force of friction in the backwards direction equals m times a. In the y direction, there's no vertical acceleration or anything, so we just have the normal force minus mg equals zero. And for the sum of the torques, we have, once again, the force of kinetic friction multiplied by r, the radius value, because again, that's the lever arm distance, equals i alpha, and that's a negative torque. So we can see that the normal force in this case is just equal to mg. If we plug that into our first kinematic equation of motion, we have negative mu k mg equals ma. And right there, boom, we can see that a is just going to be negative mu g. So even though you're not given the mass, it cancels out. So you can solve for the acceleration. Similarly, for part b, again, we can plug in the same idea into our sum of the torques, we have negative mu k mg for our force of friction times r, the lever arm distance, equals i for a solid sphere, that's 2 fifths mr squared, times alpha, and from there we can solve for alpha as well, doing some canceling out and so on, so you should be able to get a numerical value for that as well. Once you've done that, you now have numerical values for alpha and for a, and now we're on the tricky part of trying to figure out what the time is that it takes to get from the beginning to the end. So as you can see on here, I've gone ahead and identified some of my variables. We got V initial, we got omega initial, X initial, theta initial. We now know A and alpha. We want T, but we don't know the distance that it travels, the revolutions, or omega final. Um, or V final. So it seems like there's a whole lot of things we don't know. Now, since I don't know anything about distance, and I do have this added piece of information that V at the end has to equal omega times R, I'm inclined to do kinematics, but try to use my kinematic equation that avoids using distance. So if I think about that, what that means is the first kinematic equation, V final equals V initial plus A times T. Now, there's the T that I want. I know A and V initial, but I don't know V final. So I feel stuck a little bit. Well, I just got done saying I do know V equals omega R at this point. So I could do omega R equals V initial plus AT. Ooh, that's exciting. But that just introduces a different variable I don't know, omega. So let's then think about rotational kinematics. Since we are stuck just looking at linear, maybe we need to do the same kinematic equation for angular acceleration as well, or angular uh, motion. Omega final equals omega initial, which is zero, plus a t, yeah, so, or alpha t, so omega just equals alpha times time. Oh, this is exciting, so we can plug this in over here, and so we have alpha t r, that's omega times r, equals v initial plus a t, and now t is the only unknown in that equation. You have to be careful with your signs. When this works out, both your A um, here is going to be negative, your alpha is gonna be negative, but this omega should be entered as a negative in this equation, just so you're careful, because omega and A are gonna end up with the same direction. So technically, I would really almost write this as the magnitude of omega equals the magnitude of alpha times time, so that when you plug in here, this becomes the absolute value of your alpha. Even though it's a negative alpha, when you plug it in for omega, it should become the absolute value of that. So be careful. And this is negative because you're slowing. So you can solve for time. Once you have time, the problem really opens up. To find distance, again, thinking of distance, you should immediately think of either conservation of energy, or in this case, since we have time, it'll be simpler to just go with kinematics once again. And same thing with finding this final velocity, you really have everything you need to find it once you know the time. So I hope that helps you a little bit on this kind of fun and challenging question about bowling. One uh, interesting fact to think about, what happens after this point? Once V equals omega R, 
what happens at that point? What happens to the friction? What happens to the accelerations and so on? Think about that a little bit. And if you want to talk about it, ask me, let me know or shoot me an email or just bring it up in class. Anyway, hope that helps. Have a great and box worthy day.